it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Here, it's us. If we want it, if we realize it, we can do it. We can build an international forum. If you don't want to do this, if you don't want to do it, just forget it. And it's just a waste of time. It's like building a house. We need a solid basement. We need warm living rooms, probably here hot living rooms, hypothermic living rooms. We need a high-tech equipment and we need an experimental garden. If we want to build this house, I think we can realize it. It should be no problem. So what would you like to hear next year in the breakthrough news? Of course, something which is relevant to your research, to your clinical activities, where your patients, our patients benefit. But there are many, many topics. It's technology, biology, it's the different oncology disciplines, and it could also be a boost into clinical oncology trials. These are all some of the keywords where we would hope that they are more visible next year or in the upcoming years. I think important to all of us, hypothermia is not yet mainstream. I will come back to that. And if we don't have broad public acceptance, we, need, we don't only need evidence-based data, we don't only need solid clinical trials. I think we need a welcome culture, we need clear communication, and we need professional skills. Without this, I think all evidence is not the breakthrough news. Also, I think a bigger emphasis needs to be taken for communication. There are many ways to communicate. One is by cartoons. And if you just visual visualize it here, we should join forces, and this is needed now, I think, through a broadly um, supported initiative by all of us, and it should be endorsed by ESHO. This is one option that we have a takeoff for this direction. A second, if we have these joint forces, then we can face our competitors or the predators, and we're probably ready for next step. These cartoons were made by Sven, a friend of mine, for this event. Now, communication is not only talking to each other. Communication is also to have a clear message what we want and we don't want. Stefan Scheidegger was pointing out today that, you know, what we measure in hypothermia, our most relevant measurements, it's not so clear. And I would even like to go further. All of us know Wikipedia, and for fever on page four, hypothermia is defined. Hypothermia is an example of high temperature that is not a fever. It occurs from a number of causes, including heat stroke, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, malignant hypothermia, stimulants such as amphetamines, and so on and so on. No word about hypothermia as we understand it. This is our first problem. If we are not clear what we do, how can somebody in healthcare politics, how can health insurances, how can patient advocacy understand what we do? So another issue, SAR and temperature, what do we really know? What do we document? What do we need? And if we have a clear ground, I think we need to coordinate the communication in a way that we have one voice where we think it's important. And then we can shake the elephant, the establishment, and make hyperthermia a more standard part in multimodal cancer treatments. Again, a thanks to Sven. So a second part, and this is now just concept slides, we go quickly through that, is how can we boost hyperthermia now with a focus on technology research? And I'm a clinician, so I have limited competencies to show this, but I try. I think that as a radiation oncologist, 20 years ago, radiation oncology was in similar problems compared to hypothermia. It was not so well accepted, medical oncology was all over, and cancer was promised to be eradicated by at least 2020 with the help of modern research and medical oncology only. You know that the development is completely different. And I think treatment planning, delivery, temperature monitoring, QA, all can be improved with the available technology we have. And all of you work on this. We may progress, but we're probably not there. This was also a slide shown by Stefan Scheidegger today. And the only thing which I would like um, to measure, we have such a module, we have elements, we can have a concept of a treatment planning algorithm, we can describe an effect, and we can compare treatments. And we should do so. And they're fixed modules, they're flawed modules, and they're flexible modules. And this makes it more complex but I think it's feasible based on many talks we had today, and we will hear specific and better focused research talks tomorrow and on Friday. So for the planning process, we need personalization and pragmatic steps. I don't go into the wordings in detail. Personalization is a code word, a mode word, but 
still I think it's also suitable for hypothermia planning processes. And the pragmatic steps are just what is important. Local or whole body treatment, require tissue which we need to identify, high resolution treatment planning, the perfusion impact and the adapti adap adaptability of living tissues. And this must, must be verified and validated. And such a hypothermia planning in many ways can mimic what we do currently in radiotherapy. We have a placement um, of an applicator, we have a mass creation and immobilization device, we have a simulation process and then we have an optimization process afterwards. And if you look at the clinical applicability and acceptance, we just must, as in radiotherapy, respect the clinical constraints, integrate the workflow in clinical software and in available clinical software as we have it, for example, in radiotherapy, increase the planning efficacy, no way to work one week for one single patient and this three-month post-treatment because we don't have other tools. We should reduce the human factor and we need to visualize what we do and provide treatment reports. Then for the applicators, I think we can also work in modules, independent feedback loops, Lego block model systems, for example. This is hardware which is in progress um, in a cooperation partner with us at ETS, ETH Zurich. These devices can have a controlled delivery with a treatment planning required. You can verify the applicator positioning. You can adapt it during treatment with a feedback control and there is an improved targeting and steering process. Now, if we look at the next step, which is much more complex, a similar uh, model system could be developed for deep hypothermia. And there we need many constraints and many challenges to face. We have a flexible number of elements. We have a patient-specific adaptation. And for the same power um, delivered in the target, we need to reduce number of elements and reduce the healthy tissue heating. And this is feasible. We believe that this is also a step-up process which we could provide, but it's complex and it will need some time. I would like to thank Reddy Pony for this work and he will talk in detail about some of these concepts tomorrow. So this is an applicator how it could look like for this deep hypothermia system with going into any details. Um, this is a further progress and next step. So closing now for the technology, what do we need as QA requirements to boost sustainable research in hypothermia? This is another chapter. ESHO guidelines, thanks to ESHO, this is fantastic. We have an update of the superficial guidelines. We will have an update next year for the deep guidelines. We should also consider ISO certification of hypothermia units. We don't do it on a regular way. It's easy, we did a feasibility test, it's feasible, it, the um, amount of money you spend is not soaring and it can be integrated into an ISO certification process of an oncology centre, of a, a certified oncology centre. I think this is something to be considered. We could offer an ESHA label for hypothermia units participating in endorsed trials and for me also important, QA must be in our hands. It should not be a vendor specific process. And high-level QA increases automatically our acceptance. The first question of the medical oncologist is, what is hypothermia? I don't have a clear answer. And the second question is, how do you control what you do? And explain that to me, and I have a problem. For QA, we have implantable sensors, and talking about animal models, talking about bridging you know, basic research to patient research, these sensors are very helpful if you, luge and if you um, use large animal models or large animal patients. And we did so, I will explain that a little bit later, and with this implantable sensor you can online monitor what you do. And it can be of certain help for some specific questions from technology, from biology, and for us clinicians. For the superficial QA, we know that infrared cameras are, are a good um, tool, and for the deep hypothermia, phantoms need to be used. If we need to standardize this for multicentric trial, and how we should standardize this, this is also something I think committee should come up with a proposal. Hypothermia and MR is a happy marriage. We are still in the first steps. Then always, you know, every marriage is very good in the first two years and things get a little bit more critical after five years. So we'll see. But the moment I think is here, the momentum is here. And I think a lot of effort should focus on this particular um, improvement. Animal patience. It's interesting if you talk with veterinarians, they never call animals animals. Every animal has a name and any, every animal has an owner. And you need to talk to owners and animals both in an empathic way and then you have open doors. 
And with novel technology, we tried to treat a few animals which are su which were suffering from spontaneous tumors, so no lab models. And these animals currently are treated by radiation alone. And the tumors, many of those, like this fibrous sarcoma vaccine induced, they don't go away. They just have some control for a few months and then progress and the animals die. So we used selected animals accepted by the owners and pushed by the veterinarian oncologist for combined joint treatment with hypothermia with this novel device which I just uh, proposed before, which is just uh, presented to you. This was the concept, the treatment concept. So you see hyperfractionated radiotherapy and only once a week hypothermia. This is visualization of one representative case. And you see a treatment planning was done. The treatment had to be done in full anesthesia, but this is not a problem because radiotherapy is also given in full anesthesia. There is no other way for cats and large dogs. The temperature was monitored and we could, with the temperature sensors, three were implanted here, monitor really what we do and document the tumor regression with regular CT scans. This animal was uh, left with a small fibroid tumor, a minimal tumor, and I think is still alive now, two years now after treatment. So animal models for me, we can also say it's a good option to look into spontaneous tumor of animals which need medical care. And a lot of systems, technology, a lot of questions in biology can be answered through these patients, through the animal patients. Now for biology, I come closer to you. I'm not really competent and we have a lot of information of real experts here. I just would like to make four points. How to boost biology research. It's an, ex uh, an excellent experimental principle and we have so many good tools from radiobiology research. We should use them as a template and we should use them maybe also for some joint ideas together with the radiation biology and the immunobiology and the classical, more classical cytotoxic um, chemotherapy research. We have good perspectives from published basic and clinical research to better understand the rationale of hypothermia and tumor immunology and immunotherapy. But be careful. We should not just jump on the PR of pharmaceutical companies and what they promise in the glossy prints, just take the principles and give a little bit of hypothermia and then think we have a magic bullet. This will not boost hypothermia if we do it like this. We have a lot of experts here and we can win a lot of experts who can tell us the do's and don'ts if we commit to go in this direction. And we should go, but we should go, I think, in a careful and reflected way. And then the last thing, which is also biology, hypothermia modulates very basic physical parameters like tissue oxygenation and, if you like, local regional fever. And these parameters are so important as self-defense mechanisms of the body against many things, infections, early carcinogenesis, and many other disease categories. So we have so good tools to explain what we might do based on the physiology of our body. So this should go a little bit of a sound for a minute of rest for you because it's too many information otherwise. This is a two-year-old girl, no, four-year-old girl, sorry, from northern Colombia, who just enjoyed music. Good. This is a mini relax now, boosting clinical research. This is probably the core message today. We should use the past and try to compile the best possible messages from available data. Nilo Datta, I would like to thank him for compiling us on this information. He had a lecture this morning, and I will probably show you a few examples of what he tried to uh, contribute to this field. The focus, however, should be we need phase three randomized multicentric international trials. And a proposal is that discussion here afterwards, maybe during the meeting, and then if we find some common ground, have a core group who works on this, makes it some prioritization, and then a vision. Nothing more at the moment would be to present an outline maybe next year. So create evidence and facts in clinical thermal radiotherapy. Meta-analyses are only good if the studies are good. If the studies are flawed, you cannot salvage them with a meta-analysis. And we have a problem. Um, our generation, I think, missed the boat for many things where, benefit, where patients could benefit much better. Previous generation probably failed to launch these phase three trials 10, 20 years ago. 
And one important um, study was shown by Professor Data this morning, it was also quoted by others, was a kind of a meta-analysis for clinical outcomes using local regional hypothermia with radiotherapy and chemotherapy in many tumors, probably considering all available data, selecting them, filtering them with many criticism of this process, but it was something which was possible based on the available data. And you know this, this has been published and also communicated in many ways. It's good, it's good data, it's good to communicate it also to our oncology colleagues, but it's not yet there where we should be. So other work contributed, I think, to increase this knowledge, other meta-analysis, it started in 2010 by the Dutch group. A lot of credit goes to, to Kobe van der Zee and, and the, the group, and then some of the other meta-analysis also came um, under the leadership of Professor Data. And again, the same local control rate, it increases by 25%, and no significant increase in acute or light toxicity. Unfortunately, also based on the available data, we cannot say as much as we need to say about survival. This is needed. I think the impact of oral survival must be clear. Then, uh, next step in the meta-analysis effort was a network meta-analysis where you just compare 13 different multi-modality interventions and you rate them according to the response rate, to the survival rate, to the toxicity. And among the top three options, were two with hypothermia and one chemoradiotherapy with three weekly cisplatinum for locally advanced cervix cancer patients. So this is not just comparing radiotherapy and radio um, hypothermia therapy, it is compa comparing hypothermia with radiotherapy, hypothermia radiotherapy with chemotherapy, it was chemotherapy and radiotherapy, so all multimodal treatments used besides surgery in locally advanced cervix cancer. And I think this paper had some kind of good feedback from very critical colleagues too, because they said, now I start to understand. And the second thing they say is, okay, but now you need to show that in randomized trials. Then other key trials, which I think helps to put um, our discipline on solid foot, a lot of credit again to Kobe van der Zee, to the Dutch Deep Hypothermia Group, for the Lancet paper, you know this all, and the update in the Red Journal eight years later, to Rolf Issels and the group, and I think it's a very nice sign that it was called an ERTC ESHO randomized clinical trial. And then I also think for the bladder, group, for the bladder um, trial from um, Michael Wittlinger, Oliver Ott, Rainer Fietkow, I think which was very important to show that for a tumor where we see now the most referrals, for not only elderly patients who refuse cystectomy. Patients are informed, patients have the advocates, very often it's the primary care physician, and the primary care physician points now out that you have another option than cystectomy. And com combination with hypothermia is one of them. Experimental trials, I think, is also important. Thank you, Seiko, for your talk and your outline. I also think that proton therapy combined with hypothermia has a lot of potential. We have a rational, we have some early results, very early results, not more, but it seems to work and I think also here we should bundle our forces. I think it's a logic now that this could be an intercontinental effort and it could be done within a very short amount of time if we want so. Then the bad news, the sad news, the dark slides, you know them all from 1991. R2G said, yes, hypothermia works. We make a trial, we make a randomized trial, and then we have an answer. And as you know, these studies failed, and there are a lot of explanations, but still we are puzzled that things turned out so badly. The good news can be that we are now a full energy member, so this is a consortium of R2G, um, NSABP and GOG, and we did a worldwide survey for the interest for institutions within energy to participate in a hypothermia trial, specifically for locally advanced service cancer. It was sent to 120 institutions in Asia, in uh, North America, and in Europe. The bad news is that only about 15% of the institutions responded, and the bad news is that only about 2%, 3% had an own hypothermia unit. So you see energy retakes an effort, that's good. It was sent out worldwide, that's good. It was perceived, that's okay. 
but the feedback and specifically the active institution with hypothermia is low. So another step, and this is probably the third last, what do we need to have a platform accepted by all of us, clinicians, physicists, biologists, RTTs, industry, so that we can say this could fly. We need to define what are the minimal technical requirements. And I think this is important because there's no way that we want to argue for weeks and months that this device or this company should be excluded or included. We just need to define what we want and what we accept. And for the superficial hypothermia, maybe the only thing we should require is temperature measurement. Because if we do it with hypothermia, and we need a better term, because I just remember of Wikipedia, if we want to measure temperature, if we call it hypothermia, we should document it. Of course, next step would according to the published ESHO guidelines. For deep hypothermia, also simple, deep heating requirements on equipment, intracavitary temperature measurement. And for the research type of hypothermia studies, like proton therapy eventually, there I think we could ask for more and we could ask for experimental tools. I will go in some of the details. So what we need is good quality and not a mass of something. The prototype of Fesher and clinical phase three trials could be in superficial and in deep hypothermia, two separate trials, and maybe rather phase one, two trial for experimental hypothermia. So how could a superficial hypothermia multicentric protocol look like? It's very biased, it's subjective. I'm an old guy, I can do that, you can shoot me, it's not so bad. For a younger person, I would have more pity. I just use now some examples out of my belly. Recurrent breast tumors, probably we have too many good data, so we don't need it. But acceptance worldwide would be much better if we do it in a intercontinental way or in a European way. Recurrent head and neck tumors could be an option. Symptomatic bone metastasis with all the pros and cons could be an option. Minimal QA, temperature monitoring, desired QA, ESHO QA guidelines, technology open for all vendors, compliant with the minimal QA. Second category, this is just some examples, you know that all, we can fly over this, this is all common knowledge. Second category, deep hypothermia, again, my biased selection, no ranking order, locally advanced pancreatic tumors, locally advanced muscle invasive bladder cancer, locally advanced cervix cancer. That's maybe the best documented tumor, but it's not such a big concern, which is good for many European countries anymore. The required QA, according to the deep hypothermia sugar guidelines, may be wait for next year. And technology, all technology with documented deep heating capacity is welcomed. This is also common knowledge. I will not go into any of the details. Um, next is the experimental setting. This is much more complex, but I think um, we had a very nice talk before from Seiko and there are other groups interested. So maybe locally advanced soft tissue sarcoma, the chordomas, desmoid tumors can be a focus. Many others can be um, considered. It should require um, really strict QA guidelines because this is a costly, expensive, and a very um, human resource intensive um, protocol design and technology should not only document the heating capacity but we should include novel technology components for planning, for QA and for the heating um, devices itself. And research could go many ways as documented before and also during this talk you will hear much more with o over the next um, two days. We launched this study um, as Seiko pointed out about five years ago, our big problem was with a such innovative trial, A, Switzerland is small, it has almost no such patients, B, if we have such patients, we have 10 competing sarcoma centers who want to operate and who want to use the best possible um, surgical prosthesis which are available, and if you really find a patient at the end, that's maybe one patient every other year. So for such trials, I think we need to joint forces. Now, the burden to conduct such a multi study is heavy. Also, ESHO would not be, I think, in a position to really monitor this. It could be embedded into ERTC, like the sarcoma trial from um, Rolf Wissels and um, his colleagues, 
or it could also be embedded in energy, but this would need a lot of discussions. And we need those trials because without these trials, the oncology community, specifically the medical oncologists, will continue to say, nice, but, and you always have this but, without um, doubt. So what can we do in our departments to boost hypothermia? Because beside this ambitious task, which depends on our will and on a little bit of diplomacy and a little bit of luck and a little bit of money, we can do something in our department. Because if you have patient advocacy groups who say, we would like to spread the message that now in Switzerland we have an option of a non-surgical approach for muscle invasive bladder cancer. This is very often much more helpful than a highly quoted um, paper in a high impact journal. So it needs to be convenient for patients, it needs to be comfortable for patients, it must be a comprehensive treatment, cost efficient. And again, look back at the history of radiation oncology. We were in the same boots some decades ago. Now what we try in our department is to design a workflow which is jointly done for radiotherapy and hypothermia so that the stress for each patient is minimal in regard of time room changing. And this is one way to go forward. Other is not integrated um, equipment, multimodal equipment. On the other hand, you have to be careful because if you build a MRI, radiation, LINUC, deep hypothermia system, proton treatment, all in one unit, it costs a fortune, it will break down, and it needs probably one hour or two hour patient time, and you will never get a reimbursement as your hospital director would like to see it if you propose such a concept. So good news are that in Switzerland, like in Germany, we just had in December um, a feedback from the Swiss Ministry of Health that four indications for superficial um, hypothermia are reimbursed now indefinitely based on the evidence and seven for deep hypothermia which is much more costly are now reimbursed again for a two-year period and I just quoted very briefly I apo apologize for the German but I thought it's better to give you the original documents so compulsory outpatient treatment reimbursed by any healthcare provider in Switzerland is if you have a recurrence of a chest, a chest wall recurrence of breast cancer pre-radiated, if you have a recurrence in the lymph node area of head and neck tumors pre-radiated, for melanoma, metastatic or recurrent tumors, and then tumors in a palliative way but with patient suffering, so they need to have symptoms. And this is only reimbursed if patients are presented at the Swiss at the National Tumor Board. We are linked with 15 centers now on a weekly basis and patient must be presented there, treatment must be accepted, it must be documented in written. And then these patients can go undergo treatment and the reimbursement. The seven indications which we got were from 17 to 19 as I told you and then we had a long discussion with the Smith Ministry of Health. Is it a final acceptance? Do they reject everything or is it a third way? Because in two years, you cannot create new evidence. It's too short. Time period is not two years, it's 18 months, if you look at all the preparation work. And within 18 months, we could not do it, so they gave us another two year based on the provided data, and a final decision will now come end of 2020. And the scenario is that they reject everything, it's unlikely. The second scenario is that they accept everything, it's unlikely. And the third scenario is that maybe some of the indications like cervix cancer, eventual bladder cancer might go through. And for the others, they say only if patient is treated on a clinical trial. And there again, we might have a problem because if we don't have a trial in Switzerland, where is the multicentric trial where we can join? So if the vision of the multicentric trial doesn't fly, at least we should help each other better by communicating which trial is open and where we can join patients in an existing other national trial. That might be a, a pragmatic step, which is eventually more feasible. So I would like to thank um, Niloy Datta a lot. He, I think, boosted our research from scratch in RO. He helped a lot to build bridges. Dietmar Mader, um, our physicist, he did a lot of work in the QA group. Miles Kapstick, Ezra Neufeld, Ready Pony from ETIS, our technology partner. Um, they really helped us to understand what technology is and how it could be implemented for visions. Carla Rohr, she's the responsible 
veterinarian oncologist, treat animal patients, and Stefan Scheidecker, he's a model freak. And he did that very well because he understood that we have no idea of how we can better structure the complexity of clinical hypothermia combined with radiotherapy. Then a big thank you goes also to our partners, um, the networks in Switzerland. And before I close, I would like to have the second presentation. If you could put up these four slides. I would like to thank Hans Kriesi for those pictures. There is some networking on a, on a European level, and you all know this because you participate in them, and that just took one to show it here. And it was submitted for um, the Horizon 2020 grant, and very cleverly it looked at the young generation, and it looked at the specific aspect of hypothermia, which has not the complexity of a clinical trial. So it was creating integrated hypothermia radiotherapy planning, and combine this. And here you see packages, train and equip early stage researchers. We need to train the next generation, we need to get the next generation enthusiastic because many of us, all dinosaurs, they will fade away and it's our responsibility now to look for next generation. Then translate clinical and clinical results into mathematical relations for treatment planning models, apply novel treatment planning models for personalized treatment, initiate, stimulate multidisciplinary cross-pollination between the disciplines to involve um, them in hypothermic oncology and create, expand the European infrastructure. This is, I think, one of the initiatives where I would really like to congratulate um, Hans Kriesi and all participating institutions and we should see probably much more of that in the near future. Sorry for taking so much of your time. Thank you for listening and enjoy the evening. <laughs>